Okay, welcome to everybody who's already here. Um, we will get started with the workshop on mode one, interlaminar fracture toughness and the factors affecting it. I will first give a short briefing on how we run these workshops and a bit background, and then we'll start with the paper presentation by Federico. So you should be able to see my screen now. Um, you might have attended some of our previous workshops. Uh, we had a series on the strength of composites where we started off with defining how we measure strength or defining what strength is. Then we moved to tensile strength, to UD compression strength. And you see in all these links, you can download all the presentation. You'll find the link also to the workshop, um, sorry, to the recording of the workshop. Um, so we also went for shear strength, for transverse strength, and in the end, um, for laminate strength and how that links to the previous uh, workshops. Um, now we have started a new series on fracture toughness. Um, and the first one, which we had in November last year, was on whether toughness is a material parameter. Um, this was the first in the series. And today um, we'll have our first, which is on a more specific um, property being mode one interlaminar fracture toughness. Um, next, in something like half a year, we'll have mode two interlaminar. Then we'll have a joint on mode three and mixed mode um, together. We will then have translaminar and eventually also interlaminar fatigue. Um, so this is sort of how we see this series on fracture toughness um, evolving and the various topics we want to cover. The idea of these workshops is that we want to raise awareness of the difficulties and specifically experimental difficulties, difficulties in interpreting the results and the data, and also to help people to identify best practices, common issues, and to help identify next steps in terms of research, in terms of applying this in industry. What should we do to get more reliable properties for strength, or in this case, more for fracture toughness? Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the agenda. After this short introduction, Federico will take over and he will present the paper that we have shared in our invitation email. Then we will have the five minute presentations. We have 10 in total. Then we'll have some initial discussions between the panel members. And then after the break, we will open it up for the audience where you can raise your hands or use a Q&A function in Zoom to actually ask questions and have a discussion with the panel members. Um, at the end, we'll reserve some time to have concluding statements to suggest topics for the next workshop or presentations for the next workshop. And we'll stop strictly at five o'clock UK time or Central European time being, uh, five uh, being six o'clock. This is an overview of all the presenters we have. This is also the order in which we will go through them. Um, I will not um, go through all of them, but we have a really nice set of speakers covering diverse aspects of problems that you might face in a mode one interlaminar fracture toughness test. Um, I just want to conclude with a couple of ground rules. Um, we are recording this session. It will be placed on YouTube afterwards. Um, we will also share all the slides in PDF format afterwards. Um, during the discussions, please write your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand. We can um, allow you to unmute yourself at that point and ask your question orally, or we can just take the written question. You're also allowed to upvote questions if there's a lot of questions. Um, then we will try to pick up the ones that are most upvoted to the most, which should be the most important one. Um, the camera is not optional for audience, unfortunately, in this webinar um, option in Zoom. Um, if you want to use some, if you want to add some general comments or say hi to some of your colleagues or friends, you can use the chat. Don't use the Q and A for that. Um, one other limitation of the Zoom webinar system is that you cannot see the other participants. I can tell you that at the moment there's uh, more than seventy people present, and we had about one hundred forty people registering. So some more will probably join in the coming minutes. With that, I will conclude the introduction and I will pass on the word to Federico to present the paper.
yeah, we see your screen. And I think at this point, the panel members can also stop their videos. Go ahead, Federico. We do not hear you yet, though. You're still muted. Uh, and it's not in full screen anymore. <laughs> Despite trying it out just 10 minutes ago, You can't access the Finally. Room. No, it's not in full screen yet. We don't see it as full screen yet. Yes, now you can. Yes. Well, sorry. Uh, well, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to do this presentation. And thank you to be independent of lab, operator, or machine, not depend on the layup, besides independent. And there are some other factors that will be explored in this workshop. Um, okay. Um, due to the non-homogeneous character of a composite, uh, many situations where the concept of firmness can be applied, uh, we, we had to define the frame of this workshop. We see connected to the damages configuration that can appear in a composite already explained in our first meeting on toughness. One may think that the frame we have defined is too narrow. We have put composites, we have put uh, toughness, fracture toughness, mode one, inter interlaminar. Here you have a brief summary of publications involving uh, composite and delamination in three periods of time, all years and years to years, and the same adding fracture toughness and the same adding interlaminar and mode one. Uh, surprisingly, in the last two years, we have had more than 100 uh, publications involving all these terms. So we are not talking about something very narrow. There are many interests from different sides in the area we have defined for this workshop. So entering into the details, in the first meeting, we presented this defining the terminology we are going to, we were going to use involving two terms. One term is the growth direction of the, let's say crack or damage. And the second term involving crack surface orientation. This particular workshop will be devoted to this particular case where we are going to deal with interlaminar crack growing in longitudinal or in transverse direction. In some time, they must be close to the case of interlaminar cracks defined in the left-hand side of this scheme. So when talking about the, 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 the particular uh, attention to of, of this workshop, we have this scheme where we can see that the at micromechanical level, when do we say, uh, mode one, we are talking about mesomechanical level. At micromechanical level, basically uh, a, a damage like delamination uh, consists of connected debonds that can grow as uh, represented on the left-hand side, uh, longitudinal with the direction of the fibers or transverse to the fibers. Obviously at micromechanical level, you may have uh, involvement of mode one and two associated with the interface between fiber and matrix. But in this case, we are talking about uh, referring in mode one at mesomechanical level. How the property is measured? The typical test is the double cantilever beam DCV test regulated by a standard and represented in this picture. But there is another possibility less used, and we will discuss a bit about this later on, the Klimbin-Drum-Peel CDP test that is also um, 
represented in the figure and is also controlled by an ASTM on several other standards. Now, the main feature, advantages and drawbacks of both possibilities are now described in what follows. With reference to the double cantilever beam, the measurement of the crack is a complicated problem. For instance, the crack does not grow in a smooth way. A test with temperature may be required and it complicates a lot the measurement of the length of the crack. Non-symmetrical configuration requires additional specific considerations. It is only applicable for a small uh, displacement. Some indication of the thickness is uh, indicated here, and it cannot be used for inside to measurements. On the contrary, the CDP test present other set of um, features. The length of the crack does not need to be measured. Well, first of all, you have to I have to say that this test is used or has been used typically for uh, sandwich structures and um, in most cases in presence, in presence of an adhesive. Now, clearly this accept non-symmetric configurations. And in fact, the lamina pellet on the tram has to be very thin to avoid fracture when it is being curved. It is applicable for large displacement, no problem with this. And the most important thing in my opinion is that it can be adapted for inside to measurements. Now, talking about open questions about the DCB test, let's say, uh, let listed some of them associated with the own test. Is the crack from a strike? Can it be monitored from the specimen edge? Can simple equations be applied to determine crack length? Can the crack progress, the crack progress, sorry, being represented by a 2D even? Also, several approaches exist to estimate the crack length in accordance with ASTM, for instance, visual observation, onset of linearity, and 5% offset from linearity. There are other more representative approaches. I know there are because we have some contributions in this sense. Additionally, many different data reduction schemes have been developed and significant differences have been reported between analytical and numerical schemes to be used in the data reduction procedure. The toughness at the initiation of the damage process is particularly difficult to measure accurately and tends to be significantly lower than the propagation toughness. Don't worry if you don't agree with this. I know people that uh, have found exactly the opposite. I'm just putting questions on the table to try to be answered during our workshop. Now, if we talk about open questions, but now related with the nature of the material and the structure, I would like to say something about uh, the configuration of the specimen that sometimes they do not satisfy the requirements of the standards. For instance, the absence of symmetry and the presence of orientation different from zero degree are the main causes covered by this topic. The lack of symmetry involves the presence of a mode two in the progression of the damage questioning to assign G1C to the value obtained from the test. The presence of orientations different from zero clearly indicates that what is being measured is not a property of the material, of our material, but of the structure, and in this case, of our laminate. The alteration of the values measured is based on the involvement of different mechanisms of damage in the progression of the crack. Now, another series of questions. Can longitudinal interlaminar fracture toughness be similar to interlaminar fracture toughness? Can transverse and longitudinal interlaminal toughnesses be assimilated by and identified by a unique value? And the last question is, this is very important because affect to the use, further use of the values obtained in a test. Are the values obtained from a test representative of the values that control the appearance and progression of an apparently damaged associated uh, or representing a crack in an actual composite structure? This is, in my opinion, one of the main points when we talk about properties derived from measuring fracture toughness. Here in this picture, I just tried to, to represent some figures we have obtained 
uh, in a zero 90 uh, symmetric laminate. On the left hand side, the delamination consists of connected debonded, uh, debonds that appear in the 90 degree uh, ply. Whereas in the right hand side, we have the the, de the delamination represented by debonding of the 90 degree ply or, or the debonds that appear in fibers of the 90 degree ply that has appeared connected with the appearance of a transverse crack in the 90 degree ply. So are the mechanisms in this case, in these two cases, we represent an actual composite structure. Are the mechanisms of that the same that those we have in a test? A question to be answered. Now to conclude my presentation, I also always try to put something associated with the industry to make our um, meeting open to them. In fact, they participated actively as a panelist in the uh, uh, previous um, session we had. And now I have to say that values of GC are used uh, widely in the uh, aeronautical uh, companies. And there are big campaigns of tests to obtain these values. To represent uh, the necessities they have, first the interest, they have an equivalent DCB test standard, in this case by Airbus, and you have the references down. It's similar to the AESTM, but in this case, an area represented by the triangle in between the two red points is considered. Now, on the right-hand side, you have something that represents, that try to satisfy one requirement of the aeronautical industry. They want to check the, um, the, the, the good performance of a manufacturing in between, uh, for instance, in this case represented one uh, skin with stringers. So they want to have immediately after leaving the, 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 the after finishing the manufacturing, the value of the uh, toughness. And in this case, this machine is a variation of the drum peel test, and we have called it horizontal drum peel. In this case, in, the, in this panel, in one side, they put an additional material with a layer to be tested with this uh, device. The machine now is put in the middle just for the photo and to illustrate that one test originally conceived for another application can be used for inside to measurements uh, to satisfy the, the, the conditions, to, to know the conditions of the manufacturer. So with this, I conclude in my 15 minutes, <laughs> the introduction to our, the paper we have written about the mode one interlaminar fracture toughness and the factors affecting it. I have put on the table many questions, but this was my role, and I hope that we will be able to answer some of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Federico. Um, then we will jump straight into our five-minute presentation, starting with Panayotis Tsokanas. We will have ample time for questions, but after these five-minute presentations. So Panayotis, if you can start sharing your screen. Yes, thank you, Jentl. We see your screen, not in full screen yet. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Jentl. Uh, I'm going to discuss a bit about uh, a work uh, we did recently with my colleagues at KU Leuven. This work is related to uh, thin composite laminates, so we are we start with stressing out the, the need for thin laminates. Uh, these, uh, we have two main needs. The first one is uh, to have material savings. And the second, the second reason is because uh, we can achieve with thin laminates manufacturing thermal history that can be assumed isothermal through the thickness of the laminate, which is particularly important for semi-crystalline, for example, polymers whose material crystallinity is crucial in mechanical and uh, in interlaminar properties. And the reason uh, to test uh, such th thin laminates, uh, in my opinion, we have two main reasons. The first reason is, uh, as I said before, to make sure about this uniform uh, cooling rate. 
during the manufacturing. And the second one is to have some representative, representativeness uh, for those applications where thin laminates are going to be used. So uh, in our work, uh, we used um, four ply UD carbon fiber with polyamide six uh, laminates. Uh, we, we tried to test this laminate in uh, mode one, but the problem of course was that we had some uh, material yielding in the first um, steps of the loading and then sudden breakage of, uh, of, the, of the loading arms, as you can see in the, in the image here. So for this reason, we introduced uh, doublers, stiffening beams, as you can see in the, the sketch here, uh, to aluminum beams to stiffen the, the specimen. And we achieved a final thickness of about seven millimeters. But from these, from the introduction of these stiffeners, we have some issues arose, and I'm going to explain now. Uh, the first uh, issues uh, are related to the adhesion, adhesion issues of the stiffeners with the uh, composite itself. Uh, we, we tried different uh, aluminum thicknesses, as you can see in the pictures here, or different uh, adhesives or using or not using mesh within the adhesive. And in all these cases, when we tried uh, mechanical uh, surface pretreatment or chemical pretreatment, we observed uh, low surface energy and wettability issues. And actually, the main, the main problem, the main issue was that uh, the, the fracture toughness of the composite itself was, in all cases, higher than most of the uh, thermoset-based adhesives that we used. So we always had um, secondary cracks or uh, undesirable cracks in the interface between the stiffener and the composite. We also tried the atmospheric pressure plasma jet treatment, which was the best uh, surface treatment that we, we found or we could use because this plasma treatment offers cleaning of the surface, micro etching and uh, functionalization of the surface. But and in this case, and you, as you can see in this um, in picture D here, uh, we achieved cohesive failure of the adhesive. So this means that the pretreatment was very, very nice. But again, in the end, the composite, the fracture toughness of the composite itself was higher. So we had, again, a secondary failure in the interface between the stiffener and the composite. Another important issue was related to the experimental data reduction, because in the presence of uh, the stiffener, uh, we have some bending extension coupling introduced. And in the cases that the system is manufactured at high temperature, we can have also residual thermal stresses. Uh, there are some um, analytical models in the literature which, which, which we can use to consider these effects. And I saw here uh, some models, for example, the clamped model developed by Valvo. I, I give the equations here to demonstrate the complexity of these equations. Uh, but still, uh, these models are simplistic models, simplistic ones. So in our case, we needed also to, to use some numerical modeling using um, cohesive zone modeling and VCT for two reasons, actually to, to compare with the analytical predictions and be sure about the energy release rates that we, we calculated. And also we wanted in the numerical model to to assume, to simulate the, the interface of the stiffener with the composite as a perfect interface. So only in the numerical model, we, um, we assumed that we have no secondary failure in this interface in order to, to find uh, the fracture toughness values um, for the composite itself. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Panayotis. Um, and thank you for sticking to the time. Um, then we move to John Montesano. Yes, thanks, Anto. I'll share my screen. We see it. Not in presentation mode yet. Yes, now it's fine. Go ahead. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Anto. Um, so, so I'll be giving a, a, a short presentation on a new test specimen that we developed 
to extract, specifically extract the traction separation response for mode one delamination. Just wanted to acknowledge the first author here, uh, Devin Hartland, who's a PhD student of mine, and Dwayne Cronin, who's a, who's a collaborator on this work. Uh, this work was recently published in uh, Experimental Mechanics. Happy to share that uh, if anyone's interested after the workshop. Um, so the motivation really for this particular test specimen in our work was to, to effectively calibrate traction separation laws, which uh, as we know are required for CZMs. Uh, traction separation laws do uh, represent the damage process in the fracture process zone as the delamination crack is propagating. Uh, and as we know, there are different forms of traction separation laws. And, and the one that's shown in this particular uh, diagram is uh, sort of a typical trilinear uh, traction separation law, which effectively captures uh, fiber bridging, which we do see uh, in, in, in mode one for UD composites. Uh, the challenge, of course, is if we if we consider some of the existing testing protocols, uh, including the DCB specimen, which which Federico gave a nice overview of the advantages and disadvantages, uh, and, and and also the previous presenter with regards to a reinforced DCB specimen, sort of analogous to what's shown here. Uh, one of the challenges with these specimens is that they have been developed to capture uh, fracture toughness or the R curve. They have not, they're not well suited generally to directly measure traction separation law parameters. Uh, one of the challenges with, with these sort of larger samples is that the data processing, uh, processing schemes uh, cannot capture the early portion of the traction separation law. So this was the uh, sort of onset and accumulation of damage. Uh, and also, it's, it's very difficult to accurately track the crack tip given the length of these samples. Uh, as a result, uh, so for example, for a DCB specimen, and, and, and we saw that in the previous presentation, we require supplementary analysis techniques, so like, such as inverse modeling, to effectively calibrate traction uh, separation law parameters. Uh, as we know, for certain material systems, uh, for DCB specimens, this can be quite challenging to calibrate, say, the initial stiffness, if I just jump back. The initial stiffness, peak traction, and some of the other inflection points in the traction separation law. So what our, our proposed solution um, is a rigid double cantilever beam specimen. Um, and, and we take sort of inspiration from previous work that was done on ca uh, calibrating the mode one fracture of a toughened adhesive. And this the, the specimen is actually shown here where we effectively have these two metallic or rigid uh, adherence where the adhesive was was bonded to, uh, and and this sort of facilitated two things. So one, the specimen size was actually very small because the motivation for this study, as well as our work, is then to repeat these tests at high deformation rates. So effectively trying to reduce the size of the uh, specimen to eliminate inertial effects, which is quite important for dynamic testing, but also it enabled direct capture of the traction separation law during the test. So the specimen that we've sort of, we've adapted this approach and developed the specimen that's shown here. Uh, so in this case, we focused on a uh, UD glass epoxy prepreg. The fibers are aligned along the direction that the crack would propagate. Uh, so we can see that the two layers, uh, or sorry, in this case, the four layers of the, uh, of the GFRP, uh, which were co-cured onto the steel adherence, which we do assume as being rigid. Uh, and it took a few uh, iterations to uh, result in this particular uh, geometry, and, and we were able to achieve, as we'll see in a subsequent slide, a uh, stable crack propagation and, and fairly repeatable results. Uh, we were able to directly capture uh, the separation uh, on the sample uh, using these uh, displacement points at the interface between the adherence as well uh, and the uh, GFRP. So in order to, uh, to determine the corresponding tractions, um, we have an analysis proce a procedure that was adopted from previous work. There are a few assumptions here. Uh, predominantly, I, I would say the one that is important is that the steel adherents are in fact rigid. This does simplify the uh, geometry uh, and it allows us to actually correlate some of these key uh, parameters like the location of the hinge point, which uh, would in fact move um, and, and shift during the test. So we have expressions here that are derived based on a force and moment balance. So we can calculate uh, our traction and our uh, hinge point location by solving these two equations. And that allows us to develop our traction separation laws, which we see here for these particular, uh, this particular specimen. Um, and I just have a, a video here where you can actually see the stable crack propagation um, using digital image correlation 
And what we saw very, very nicely, we compared this with a, a, a rigid D, or a DCB specimen, uh, standard DCB specimen. The arc curves are shown here. The onset of, uh, uh, of crack growth or G1C onset is actually quite consistent with what we measured using the, uh, the rigid double cant or the rigid double cantilever beam specimen, which is shown on the right. Uh, there are some challenges with capturing um, the steady state uh, G1C, but that's of course open maybe for question and discussion later on. So thank you, Yanto. Thanks everyone. Yes, thank you. Michael, I see you have your hand raised. If you wanna say something, you can do it now while um, we are transitioning to the next speaker, which is Bodo Fiedler. No, sorry. Don't know why that happened. I didn't touch anything. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Go ahead, Bodo. Uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity here to speak. And I want to show you, you see on the screen, how to measure crack lengths in DCB test here. And uh, so we developed a new method for yeah determination the crack lengths or the crack opening displacement actually in the calculation and the testing of the DCB test specimen. Just I mean we have already seen this how it is usually done and there are several methods to do the I would say evaluation of the of the test different methods. So the common one the very traditional one is to have these marks and measuring optical just by observation, the crack lengths or by video, there are several methods. However, <clears throat> so we developed, so I have to make it very brief, we introduced the capacitance, so capacity measurements. And um, so actually when the crack starts and crack propagates, the um, permittivity is changed. And this is used, you see on the screen on the, Right here, the um, some the like a simple capacitor, and then we have the electric field. And if we now perform the test, you see on the on the figure below, we have the capacitance drops more or less linearly with the crack length. And um, so then we get the slope here, uh, slope m, from the capacitance. And this is actually because the crack has the capacity permittivity of air and the material has its own capacitance, so permittivity. So, and then the ratio uh, changes just with regard to the length of the crack. So that's a basic idea. And it works, um, so we, for glass fiber, um, for GFRP, we just uh, use the uh, adhesive copper foil, which is used for SEM investigations. And we could apply this. And then we have, for example, nano-modified, so conductive glass fiber for GFRP. Then we just put an insulation as well as for carbon fiber polymer, uh, fiber reinforced polymer, you see here on the left, uh, respectively on the right-hand uh, schematic, that we just have to add another permittivity so it's just an um, insulating film, ad film adhesive so that the conductive um, contact is separated from the composite, from the conductive composite. So that's our ideal capacitor. So now if we, if we now perform the test and do some calculation, you see on the, on the left uh, figure, we usually have on the very left one, the force versus crack opening then we have characteristic points, nonlinear point, visual indicator that something happens, or we could take the 5% compliance increase and so on and so on. So characteristic points. And so what we did now, we plotted the normalized capacity. So it's just normalized from the beginning capacitance and this decrease with a crack opening. And then we could define, this is the gray line in the middle and on the right hand. And then we have a starting, uh, so the blue line. And for example, we could say we have 5% capacitance decrease just as a number or 2%. It's up to you how to define it. On the very right, you see, we could define the capacitance as a tangent uh, construction. 
similar to the, how to say, um, blast transition temperature, for example, where we do similar things. And then if we have defined our point where the red cross is in this figure, we go down and we get the corresponding crack opening. And this crack opening, we can now define in our force crack opening curve, the reference points from the capacitance measurements. And this is uh, shown here on the on the uh, left hand graph. So force crack opening for the different point, non nonlinear point compliance, capacitance tangent, capacitance percentage, and on the right hand side you see this just as one example. We did this for a couple of materials. How the variation and the measurement was done, and the result is so it's a far good agreement, and. Um, so then we validate it because we can also do um, this test without measuring the correct length. So just with the beam theory. And um, so the uh, numbers are given, the equations are given here. And you see that on the right-hand side that in the, yeah, what's the, the black one is a capacitance method and the other curve, the colored curve is a beam theory. And you see that at the very end, the beam theory has some deviation to our capacitance measurement. And this is because at high displacements so or crack opening, so the beam theory is not valid anymore. So in this case, I would trust more on the capacitance method. And that's basically what, uh, what we measured. And in addition, the crack length, so the crack form is not uh, straight. So in case where we place here on the figure on the right hand side, our metal, so our electrode material, we are measuring the actual crack progress or crack length. That's maybe another advantage of that. So that's basically, we have uh, presented this on the last workshop in Le Brille in Switzerland. That's our funding partners, our colleagues, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bodo. Um, then we move to our fourth speaker, Tanasis Shatsia Tanasiu. Hello, Jento, thank you. Share my screen adequately. You can see my screen? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you to the organizers, first of all, for hosting this series of, of webinars. Truly interesting. Today, I will be touching upon some aspects that were already mentioned by Federico and by the previous speakers as well. Uh, questions such as, is edge monitoring sufficient? Is the crack front straight? Uh, those questions we are tackling in this study using X-ray computed tomography. So, as you can see here, the standard test method, typical DCV specimen, we apply tensile load on the specimen arms of this rectangular beam, and we obtain a mid-beam interlaminar delamination. Unfortunately, the standards, if we take a close look at them, we will see that they are rather limited in terms of their applicability, as they are only uh, applicable for unidirectional laminates, meaning only the zero, zero interface can be tested. When we change the interface, we're deviating from the standards, and therefore, this might cause some issues. They are also limited to quasi-static crosshead displacements, so no high strain rates, no fatigue. And during testing, we typically monitor the load, the opening displacement, and the crack length, with which we can reduce the data and obtain this, the, the desired resistance curve, which plots the strain energy release rate versus the crack length. Now the problem starts, or the, the potential issue starts where we already mentioned, there are numerous ways to define initiation. We can use the nonlinearity point in the, in the load displacement curve. We can use the, the offset 5% increase in compliance, or we can visually detect the crack length using edge monitoring techniques, a camera, for instance, or if we, if we want to be even more sophisticated, we can apply digital image correlation. And, and with certain methods, we can quite accurately extract the crack length from the edge. Now, unfortunately, these edge monitoring techniques, they don't give us any information on the bulk. And as Federico mentioned, the crack front, is it straight? It's not necessarily straight, even for unidirectional laminates that comply with the standards. Unfortunately, or realistically, when we change the interface, we also have 
some damage mechanisms that are engaging that are also three dimensional that can extend to different plies. For instance, fiber bridging, uh, intraply damage, and crack migrations, and all of those damage phenomena they complicate our assumed straight crack front. X-ray computer tomography can shed lights can shed light on on these aspects. Whereas the penetrating source uh, can give us a, a volume image. And as you can see on the right, in this case, it's a carbon epoxy laminate, which can be easily segmented, and we can take out the air in the mid beam phase, which designates our crack front. Now, this crack front, as you can see, is not by no means straight, it's quite irregular. And the, the interesting thing was that observation occurred within the linear elastic region, so prior to the nonlinearity point. So you can see the benefit in this technique. We can accurately define initiation without having to use arbitrary points such as the nonlinearity. Um, now, this is a zero zero interface, so it complies with the standards. And the benefit in this case is that, as you can see, I don't have to use a camera on the edge or the other edge, which one is the correct one. And then I can do it in situ, meaning under load, I can take multiple scans and see how the crack from profile, uh, the crack from profile evolves into time. So question, is edge monitoring sufficient? Well, in my opinion, it's definitely not sufficient if we want to expand the applicability of the standards. And I will show a complex, a complex uh, ex experiment here, a, a complex example here. If we change the interface ply orientation from 0, 0 to, let's say, plus minus 45, you can see that the crack migrates. This gives us a three-dimensional damage mechanism that evolves and has and raises the questions of whether is it a pure mode one test? Is it now a mixed mode condition? How can we define it with edge monitoring techniques? And this brings us back to a question that was raised by Professor Ramesh Tazreja in the previous workshop. We are trying to quantify a mesoscale property which relates to microscale damage mechanisms. How to do that is by no means an easy feat. And the last question on initiation detection. For example, we've seen that a crack might initiate prior to the nonlinearity point. Should there be a minimum crack length that we can say ah, this is initiation? It's up for a debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thanasis. And you to our fifth speaker, Lindsay Phil. Thank you, Yanko. I'll start sharing. Can you see it? Yeah, see it? go ahead. Thank you. Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me for this workshop in which I'm going to present the work we did in our team on fractured toughness of 3D printed composite. And it's at the part of the PhD work of Amalia and Stratos. We used diffused filament fabrication material extrusion technique. It's a thermoplastic filament, in this case, a continuous fiber in a polyamide matrix that is extruded through a heated nozzle and deposited on a non-heated build plate. The unreinforced uh, polyamide that you see here in yellow is in this particular case used for top and bottom and wall protect, let's say, the part, but is removed to do our delamination test. The Mark Porsche printer is used in this case, and as you all know, this uh, doesn't allow us too many liberty. It forces, let's say, to use the default setting for nozzle temperature and print speed. Now, the interlaminar bonding challenges in material extrusion arise from both the manufacturing process and the material properties. Because of the narrow, let's say, processing window of the polymer and the layer-wise deposition that we have, uh, that allows the, sub the substrate to cool down before a new layer is deposited, it is difficult to form a strong bond between the printed layers. 
in conventional composites, you also have, let's say, a kind of consolidation and that presses the layers together, but if you use filament fabrication, this is not the case. Void fraction is another problem uh, or another challenge, let's say, and due to the high viscosity of the polymer, uh, the deposit filament cannot spread out sufficiently. And on top of that, you also have, uh, before printing, you have already voids in your filament um, and that can stay, let's say, after the deposition. Now, to characterize the mode one fracture toughness, we did double cantilever beam tests. And we tried, or we started with printed samples. So we did not cut our specimens from a plate in order to avoid, if you have print large plates, you have a high risk that your nozzle blocks during the printing process. Now we, in, we inserted a Teflon film, a PTFE film uh, to start as a crack initiator. And what we first had is that we saw that we had a uh, crack migration throughout the specimen. So we did all types of trials, let's say doublers. Uh, we saw several of these in the work of Panafitis. But in the end, what we decided is to go uh, to a thicker uh, DCB specimen with 56 layers of UD printed continuously carbon fiber reinforced layers. Now, the fracture toughness at crack initiation was evaluated according to standard methods, analytical methods, and numerical methods. The reason why we did this is because, first of all, we are using 3D printed composites, and that is not part of the topic of the ASTM standard methods, which are made for convention with printed materials. Um, made materials, sorry, and not for 3D printed ones. And on the other hand, also to do a comparison between the different um, data um, analysis techniques. Now, the standard recommend the uh, beam theory and the compliance calibration methods to calculate the fracture toughness. So, and uh, the, the modified beam theory or the beam theory, Euler Bernoulli th theory is assumed where you say that the, the section is, stays flat and uh, perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam during bending. This, of course, is less accurate for short beams and thick beams, or beams subjected to high shear forces. Now, the beam theory uses, of course, the um, correction factors uh, based on the experiment. Um, meaning that they are calculated from the relation between the experimental compliance and the measured crack rate. Then we go to the analytical models where we use the modified beam theory based on order Bermud that we just discussed. And there are the different or novel joint, um, models, let's say analytical models uh, developed by Xiang Wang, the rigid joint model, uh, where you um, assume that they no rotation and translation at the crack tip. Same a rigid model where you release the, uh, the, the constraint from the rotation and then the flexible, um, which takes both into account. And as we know, these are be based on the shear um, theory, Shimotenko beam theory. The numerical models are the conventional ones, let's say the cohesive uh, film method and the VCCT. Now go to the results. As you can see here, the standard, the analytical, and the BCC. Let's make conclusions. We see that the beam theory and the rigid um, joint model present an underestimation because they ignore the displacement and the rotation at the crack tip. The beam theory even more underestimates because we are here having quite thick laminates and there is no uh, shear connect correction in this case. The rest of the methods yield more or less the same results, but we do see some high variability in the experimental data. So compared to literature, we see that we have quite some similarity with the uh, data um, reported in literature. We see a huge difference, difference with the model of A 
but there we uh, mentioned that they have a quite high volume fraction, a void percentage, let's say, of 12.5% versus 7.5% for Lira. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Lindsay. Now we move to Ben Sørensen. Yes, thank you. Can you see my screen? So we see your screen, but not in full screen mode yet. Yes, I will. Uh, we still don't see it. It's still in. Uh, it's not in full screen mode yet. It worked before. Yeah, or as I said, you can put it in full screen first before you share it. That usually avoids this problem. I cannot. Yeah. Okay, I will just drive without full screen then. Okay. Um, but you need to. Well, you need to start sharing again then. You're not sharing anything at the moment. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, okay. Oh, good. I, um, yeah, I, I would uh, recognize my co-author, Ruben Rivas. I'm from the Technical University of uh, Denmark, and I will talk about to bring how we can maybe bring fractal mechanics testing beyond linear elastic fractal mechanics and, and measure cohesive laws. And uh, the basic motivation is uh, that many materials that are actually showing rising fractal resistance are curved behavior, which is beneficial because it can stabilize or arrest cracks. And it can be modeled by cohesive zone modeling. It's uh, widely implemented in fine element modeling, but it's rarely used uh, the, the real measured cohesive law, but if we do that, we would make more accurate predictions. And um, here's one motivating example. Uh, in this case here, we, we have a, a problem uh, where a, a, a specimen is loaded in, in, in tension and there's a pre-existing crack, and, and then there's a possibility for a delamination and the possibility that the crack could uh, penetrate uh, down to the substrate. So this is modeled by two different uh, cohesive laws, one for the interface and one for the penetrating crack. What controls when that happens? Well, this is a graph over here. Uh, this shows a ratio of the fractal toughness of the substrate and the interface. This axis here shows the, the ratio of the strength of the substrate and, and interface cohesive laws. And we see, and the red curve is making the demarcation between when we have penetration into substrate and to the right-hand side is when we have deflection into uh, uh, the, the interface. And we see that when the, uh, the, the uh, strength of, of the uh, penetrating crack is very low between uh, two, two or lower than twice of that the interface, then irrespective of the ratio of the fracture energy, we always get penetration. If it's very high, uh, above five, then except for very low fracture energy ratio, we always get crack deflection. So actually, whether we have crack deflection or crack penetration along this interface, this is more controlled by peak stress values than it is controlled by uh, fracture energy ratios. This is another study where related to the formation of a secondary crack. Uh, the formation of a secondary crack is, is actually also beneficial because uh, if you grow primary crack, we have one uh, crack fractal process zone that uptake energy, but with a secondary crack, we can have two fractal process zones, so we can have maybe doubling or most of the fracture, macroscopic fractal energy. Um, again, uh, what controls this? This uh, plot shows the overall fractal resistance normalized by the fractal uh, resistance or fractal energy of the primary crack. This uh, x-axis or subtle axis shows the ratio of the peak stress of the secondary crack to the uh, primary crack. If the, if the peak stress of, uh, of the secondary crack is higher than, than the, the primary one we are up here, and the secondary crack doesn't form at all, and so the fracture energy is just uh, of that of the primary crack. But if it's lower, we have the, we have the possibility of getting these um, secondary crack and then extra uh, energy uptake. Yeah, so um, uh, 
the way we propose to measure uh, cohesive loss is by the j integral approach. We need to have specimens, we need to have j integral solutions for, for specimen, either by force, it's force times rotation, or we prefer to apply moments. Uh, in any case, the relationship between the, the traction separation law and the j integral value is that the j integral value is, is the area integration of the traction separation law from zero to the end opening delta n star is the end opening of the, the bridging of the cohesive zone. And I uh, would like to move this one now here. Uh, <laughs> I can. Um, if we differentiate the equation, then uh, with respect to the end opening, we actually get the traction separation law. So if we measure the fractal resistance as function of end opening, we can differentiate this relation and get the traction separation law. And this is something we have been uh, doing. Here's a study for glass fiber composites. This is fractal resistance as function of, of end opening. Uh, let's focus on uh, this part here. This is initiation. And then we have a bridging developing up to this steady state level. If we now make it fit to this rising curve, the blue curve, we can uh, do a, a, a differentiation of this and get what the traction separation is in the bridging. It's quite remarkable that the bridging tractions are actually very low, less than one, uh, one megapascals. What happens at the crack tip is more challenging. We have an initiation value of about 200, and we also try to, to measure the, the uh, cohesive law of that. To do so, we need to measure our displacements in much more accuracy. So this is end opening measured in micrometers. So the experiment is the B specimen loaded with moments inside an environmental scanning intron microscope. We calculate the change angle, and we have these red experimental data. The stars are when we have initiation, but we can fit curves to those data, and then we can differentiate and get traction separation law of the crack tip. And here we get quite high traction values, stresses in the order of 50, 60, millimeters um, uh, megapascals, but the openings are less than about uh, 10 micrometer. So uh, final slide is a little bit about the challenges and outlook. It is challenging to measure the cracktive cohesive law because it requires high resolution. So we need to do it in microscope. We also need to ensure that we have a sufficient uh, narrow specimen so there's no crack front variation across uh, the width. But it's also rewarding that we can get a cohesive law that are really accurate. And with this, I will stop my presentation. Thank you, Ben. Then we move to our next speaker, which is John Botsis. So can you see the screen? No. We don't see any screen yet. That's not possible because we settled it earlier. Okay, uh, share screen. I have to go back to share screen, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, now it's loading. Yeah, and then set it in presentation view. Better? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so thanks again for, for inviting me. Uh, I will uh, be talking to you today about mode one fracture toughness and the lamination of layered composites. I will limit myself on, uh, on, uh, on initiation uh, rather than identification of bridging tractions, etc. This work has been published uh, anyway, so for those interested, uh, can look at the references uh, in each slide. So I would like also to thank or to acknowledge the contribution of George A. Pappas in this work. So uh, the objective of the work, of, of our work throughout the years, is to characterize toughness and traction separation relations of UD and MDF uh, F, uh, uh, carbon fiber uh, laminates in mode one. We have also mode two and combined mode, but this is not of today. So uh, the questions we are trying to answer is that, uh, or to address is, are the current standards appropriate for the UD and MD layouts? This is, of course, of the objective of this, uh, of this uh, workshop. And what uh, produces the observed scale effects in the lamination? So here are uh, uh, what we have done uh, in terms of materials. We have carbon epoxy from Gerrit, autoclave curing, 
monotonic QD, the interlaminar and intralaminar, and then also ankle ply monotonic uh, uh, of specimens with the same stiffness. Don't forget that. So we have also fatigue, but I will not address this. Now, for the data reduction, we have the linear case, as you can see here. And then for the nonlinear case, we have the J in the gun. So this is going to be proven very, very useful, especially in the MD laminates. So the experimental techniques are, are listed here. What you don't see in this list is the, uh, uh, the, the micro CT, which I forgot to add, but uh, we are going to talk about this. So uh, uh, as you can see here, we have different thicknesses because one of the objectives was to test or to examine the effects of scale and that's the thickness and also the width, for example, in uh, MD laminates or in, in uh, cross-ply laminates. So, uh, the geometry plays an important role, but, uh, and I, but uh, we will see through. We have also used two distinct testing configurations, the end opening force and then the pure moment. Uh, the pure moment device is in house. Uh, it was constructed in house. Now here is how we are measuring the J, uh, the J integral for the DCB specimen. We have again here uh, uh, attached two rigid bars uh, uh, on the loading, on the loading uh, pins, I'm sorry, loading blocks. And then during propagation, we measure the angle theta. We can look at it at the initiation or at the propagation, depending on what you want to check. So, so finally, for the results, so I'm sorry, part of the methods also, the STM standards, okay, we use them, of course. Uh, the problems uh, associated with the standard is the nonlinearity, the visual observation of delta A, uh, uh, sorry, the initiation is defined at nonlinearity or visual expansion or load offset at 5%. The potential problems, though, are I think that they have all, they were also mentioned earlier. Inaccuracies in measuring delta A, nonlinearities, crack from geometry, bridging fibers, bias in compliance fitting. This is forgotten, but it is a very, very important uh, aspect. Uh, there's another method to measure uh, mode one uh, uh, fracture toughness on UD tape or woven fabric. It is uh, the DIN uh, 6033, I think it's mostly by our space. It's again a DCB specimen. Uh, they are looking at, uh, or this standard measures the energy from the load displacement curve of a crack increment of about 90 millimeters. All right, it's, uh, it's nice, but the problem is the scale effects, okay? Uh, of delamination. <clears throat> so uh, now let's go now to uh, to another top, another aspect. It is really the uh, cross plies. Uh, no, sorry, uh, uh, MD laminates or angle plies. Now reported data in the literature uh, on angle ply are not consistent and neither neither consistent nor conclusive. Uh, the ASTM standard does not work well for for these materials because of inaccuracies in crank length measurements. Again compliance fitting and the nonlinearities, so, as we can see. Uh, the, uh, so uh, what we have done in our lab, of, uh, it's to use the J integral as you saw it earlier, uh, to calculate, uh, to calculate uh, the toughness at initiation and also during propagation. Uh, so this really uh, avoids uh, quite a few problems uh, or at least uh, uh, issues that are related to this uh, the crack front, uh, where the crack starts from where, the nonlinearity. So this is everything, you know, this method doesn't really depend on these measurements and, and it's, it's really uh, giving very good results. So uh, origins of fiber bridging. Uh, if you take a material with a rather brittle uh, matrix, uh, what you are going to see is a very nice crack huh? and no bridging. But if you take a tough matrix, okay, uh, the crack will, initiate and grow in fiber rich zones, creating fiber bundles and thus bridging. So uh, now you have here different thicknesses, the same initiation or UD, okay? Initiation is the same, but the R curves are different. What creates the scale effect? The scale effect is created by the fact that the fiber bridging bundles take bending. So this bending interacts with the, 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 the bending stiffness of the loading arms, creating thus the scale effect. So here, and then I will, I'm, I'm going to finish. This is now the results on uh, angle ply. 
I want you to concentrate on this X-ray to computer tomography. Those are again uh, the same stiffness specimens. The crack is bowing, but it is very symmetric. Okay, uh, throughout uh, you know the crack length throughout a long uh, crack uh, crack uh, length, and as you can see here, okay, uh, you may have inter or nitra, but what is important is that uh, if you can see here, okay, uh, uh, in the upper right column, the J at initiation is consistent. It is the same uh, for every uh, for every angle ply tested. Uh, three anti-symmetric ones, as you can see here in the table, okay, using the J integral approach. Now, I will not go into the details of this because of lack of time. Then I will conclude <clears throat> with this list. Uh, for UD laminates, I think the ASTM standard can be trusted uh, if, if, if run properly, okay? Uh, but for MD, uh, for MD uh, will not be uh, as, uh, as good. Okay, uh, I didn't uh, because of the issues we mentioned. Now the, the the pure moment and the end opening force testing configuration give different results because of the bending taken by the fiber bundles. So the the pure moment testing is not really what we call universal testing uh, testing configuration. So I will stop here for for today. Thank you. Thank you, John. We have three presentations left, starting with Antonio Blasquez. Hello, and thank you. Uh, I will share my... Yeah, we see your screen, full screen now. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this presentation, I'll discuss fractional properties governing the lamination in cross ply composite lamina, specifically the lamination induced by transfer crack. Usually, the, ah, usually to analyze the lamination crack, uh, uh, research use a mesomechanical model, uh, but the morphology of the delamination damage is much more complicated uh, than that reproduced by the meso model with a crack progressing along a perfect and uh, perfectly determined uh, interface between two layers uh, with usually different figure orientation. This image in the, on the left shows a 3D schematic of the fever uh, distribution near the, well, let me uh, call it interface between a zero degree uh, ply and a 90 degree ply. Uh, damage associated with the transfer crack is shown here in, in red. Um, something like delamination damage are uh, shown in, in yellow. Depending on the position of the post polishing plane, we can see uh, the bond in the, uh, well, the, the, the lamination damage in the 90 uh, degree plane or in the zero degree plane. These links with these uh, pictures already shown by Professor Paris. In the one on the left, the polishing plane is placed in, in, in a, a point where the, the lamination manifests by the bonding in the, in the 90 degree, and in, in this one along the zero degree. Taking all these ideas in, in mind, on to account the toughness of the transfer crack uh, and the delamination crack should be measured by tests in which the actual morphology of the damage are reproduced as close as possible. For this purpose, uh, we have considered a cross ply laminate and determined the transfer crack and the delamination crack toughnesses using global uh, energy balances. If we could obtain a configuration with, uh, uh, with a nearly complete transfer crack without delamination 
<coughs> with the lamination, uh, uh, we can uh, obtain, analyze, uh, well, we, we uh, I, I will refer to a, config, a configuration that can be analyzed with this model. Then uh, if we can obtain a configuration that is in this case, this configuration for the material we have used, we can obtain the, the fracture toughness of the transverse crack uh, using this balance. Uh, in this case, this two is associated to the uh, symmetry plane in vertical symmetry, uh, horizontal uh, symmetry plane. And the other two, this one, is associated to the vertical uh, symmetry plane. Uh, the, the, this value of 130 Julius per, per uh, square meter is a preliminary uh, result because uh, residual stress have not been uh, considered. Well, we know that uh, this configuration is really difficult to obtain because of the Cook Gordon effect, but we uh, assume only a small, uh, like the lamination, uh, the bondings here. Uh, if thickness in the 90 uh, ply are bigger, then the lamination appears and we can use, we use then this energy uh, balance in which we assume this is the transfer energy, uh, transfer toughness uh, already obtained. This is the a full thickness of the of the 90 degree ply and this is the toughness of the delamination graph. Uh, we use four because we assume a symmetric configuration. In this case, uh, using a boundary element method, we have obtained a GC for the uh, interlaminar toughnesses uh, about 60. Uh, joules per square meters. Uh, it is uh, now I have to explain why we, we are put here G1C and not GC. This is because for the uh, length of the delamination we have obtained it, that you can see in this picture, most of the of the delamination uh, cracks uh, are in dominant mode one. Uh, in this case, we assume this this G one, this to be the G one C. This is only to to show a uh, dimensionless parameter. Okay, this is lambda is the length of the delamination crack. Uh, T90 you know, T, T is the semi thickness of the uh, 90 degree. Uh, well, uh, well I, only to, to finish, I will I will to mention that uh, the result shown in these slides are preliminary, residual stress are not included, and they are, are based on what we can see in the lab. That is, uh, the configuration of the damage in the surface of the specimen. Nevertheless, the values obtained are much lower than other published by other research and also in my group using different approaches. And this opens the discussion about the representativity of this value of the value of the toughnesses obtained, obtained from the test when using them in the design of an actual structural comfort. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Antonio. And we move to Jesus Justo. Thank you, gentlemen. And also thanks to Michael and Federico. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about 
intralaminar failure in two propagation directions. I will begin oh, sorry. with the motivation of the work. I'll talk about some problems that appear during the fabrication of the specimens. Then I'll show the experimental campaign and the results obtained, and finally a, a brief summary. Using the same sketch presented by Federico, I'm going to focus on this part in which intralaminar propagation appears. We wanted to check if the longitudinal intralaminar crack propagation and the transfer intralaminar crack propagation had the same fracture toughness. Initially, we thought of, about using the DCB test, but we discarded it because it required a huge number of layers to be laid up. And also we were not very sure about the behavior of the crack during the test. So we decided to use a three-point bending test in which you can see this is a typical three-point bending coupon, but with a pre-crack. And then during the test, the crack should propagate in the vertical direction. So the objective of the work was to evaluate and compare the fracture toughness in the longitudinal case and through the thickness case, both intralaminar. This is the, these are the sizes of the coupon. And you can check that in the longitudinal one, the fibers are oriented vertically. So the crack propagates parallel to the fibers. And in the transfer case, the fibers are horizontal. So the crack propagates perpendicular to the fibers. Mm. Regarding the fabrication of the specimens, it was, it was very difficult. In the case of the transfer, for example, the number of layers determine the height of the coupon. So the length that we will let the crack to propagate we needed a minimum crack length in order to, to follow the crack propagation. So we decided to use 100 layers. And in the case of the longitudinal ones, the number of layers determined only the thickness of the coupon. So we put 53. Another problem was to obtain uh, the pre-cracks that were located in the correct place and were straight. So in, instead of using uh, the typical the molding layer, we used metallic blades covered by the, the molding layer. And these blades were located using metallic support blades. And then we cured them in the autoclave and obtained the specimens. The specimens were cut from these panels. This is a view of the test of the longitudinal, one of the longitudinal coupons. Notice that the fibers are vertical, so the crack propagates parallel to the fibers. And this is an example of a typical curve in which we perform a preload then we let the crack propagate unstable. We generate, we really generate the crack. Then we unload fully the coupon and then we reload the coupon, obtaining unstable crack growth. This is a view of the failure surface. In the case of the transfer, the process was the same. In this case, the fibers are located in this direction and the curve obtained is in a similar way than before. To obtain the fracture toughness, we have used the area method in which we simulate a virtual cycle with a low crack propagation and a low. And the area inside of it is the energy dissipated that can be correlated with the fracture toughness. This is a table with the mean values obtained for several coupons. The dispersion obtained is very small. We were happy with this. And we can see that in the case of the longitudinal, the fracture toughness obtained, notice that these are not universal values. These are only related with this three-point bending test. The longitudinal one is 561, and the transversal one, 408. It's a small. So we have performed a test campaign to evaluate fracture toughness when the crack propagates intralaminar parallel and perpendicular to the fibers using three-point bending tests. The fracture toughness when the crack propagates longitudinal is 37% higher in our case when, than when the crack propagates perpendicular to the fibers. And one potential explanation about this is that whereas for longitudinal interlaminar crack propagation specimens, the crack has to grow following the path prescribed by the fibers in order to avoid breaking fibers. For transfer intralaminar crack propagation, the crack is relatively free to grow following the most favorable crack path according to the stress distribution. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jesus. Then we have one presentation left from Torquato Garuli. Hey, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, so I'll show my screen. 
Can you see my screen? Yes, but we see the wrong screen, so you have to swap screens. Okay, what about now? Nope, still the same. Okay. Is it the wrong one? So still the, the wrong screen that you're sharing. So it's the one. Okay. No, no. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay, let me take my pointer. Okay, so. Um, Thanks uh, to the organizer for inviting me and thanks to everyone that attended the workshop. So in the line of structure tests, why we love the directional specimens, why we get multi-directional ones, and can this change? Now I want to start trying to explain why we should even ask those questions. And the reason is quite simple, and it is that in most Structural application, we use multi directional laminates, but all the standards that we have uh, to perform interlaminar structure tests recommend uh, the use of unidirectional specimens. So, why is that the case? Is it that this is conservative? Is it that the toughness that we get is the same? Uh, I would say that in both cases, this is not at use, and in any case, conservative doesn't always mean. And we also have cryptographic evidence that different interfaces um, have different mechanisms going on, which could imply uh, a different structure toughness. So, my question is is it that we use unidirectional specimens just because we like them more? And if so, why is that we like them more? So for sure, one first reason is the lamination migration, and two, this was historically the first big problem uh, encountered when testing multi-directional specimens. And as of today, we know much better how it works. We know that it has to do with the result spreads uh, in the interface that we are testing, and to the orientation of the fly towards which we spread it right. Uh, the propagating crack. Uh, we know that depending on this orientation, we can have or have not migration, and uh, it will not happen for unidirectional specimens, while it can happen for multi directional ones. So, in particular, we can avoid this actually for more to a mixed mode testing uh, test, but not uh, in principle for uh, mode one. Now, another reason could be the presence of thermoelastic couplings. And this is because when you design a specimen for a standard test, uh, you would like to have the simplest behavior possible. And if you compare the behavior of a unidirectional laminate with that of a multidirectional one, you see a striking difference in the fact that yeah, we have a lot of zeros. And all these terms are what we call the thermoelastic couplings. And these create a uh, Range and undesirable uh, mechanical behavior, and they generally exist in multi directional laminates. We actually know how to avoid uh, most of them, but the things become much more challenging when you have to design a dimension specimen, avoid all of them in all the parts of the specimen, and still be free to choose the delamination interface. And even if you were able to avoid that, there is uh, something else that we call the punitive effect. And this has to do with the typical size of the delamination specimen where the width is comparable to the two crack length. Now, this means that in general, it's difficult to say if you should consider your specimen to be under plain stress or plain strain condition. But it turns out that uh, the stress state depends also on material properties and in particular on this ratio that has been long used. And for the unidirectional 
assessment, this ratio is very low. And what this means is that the stress and concern condition is pretty much the same. So whatever you are with your aspect ratio will not change much. And therefore, you will not have any effect from uh, with. On the other end, for multi-reaction assessment, uh, this ratio can be potentially high. And therefore, uh, these two conditions are very different. And you will see the effect from the fact that your stressing has uh, a full field. In particular, this will lead to an even energy demonstration front, so curved demonstration front, and even many cells in propagation. Finally, another reason could be the presence of thermal residual stress. We know that this will develop both at the micro scale and at the micro scale in the case of multi-directional laminate. So for the multi-directional assessment, we will only have micro residual stresses, and it's been uh, proven that this should not affect uh, the fractured patterns. On the other end, for multi-directional specimen, we will have both micro scale and fly level stresses. And uh, there's, there has been uh, the suggestion that that was not lay up with L, but of course, this constraint a lot uh, the design space and even the interface that we're going to test. Furthermore, this only solves problem from uh, thermal coefficients, actually. And even if you use layouts of this type, but you're able to change the residual stresses, you will see an effect on the fracture toughness. Furthermore, both micro and mesoscale residual stresses uh, reduce the effective strength of the of the plies, so facilitate migration. So can this change? Uh, I think we can only if we are able to solve all these problems that I've been showing. So in this context, a few years ago, we proposed the use of linear double multi-directional specimens, which are multi-directional specimens in a unidirectional like thermoelastic behavior. And they also need a lot of freedom in the design of the specimen. So a first set of experiments that we did gave promising results, but unfortunately, these were done uh, not on a unidirectional based material, but what they call a quasi QT fund. Still, we think that with this, uh, we have only a few things missing to solve, and in particular, it's uh, understanding whether we can avoid migration in mode one. And in my opinion, there is still quite a lot to understand about the effect of the super stressors. So, to conclude, I think that there are many reasons that. Uh, make us love the interaction of specimens, not least the fact that the toughness that we get with them allow reasonable structural predictions, as Michael uh, pointed out in the last workshop. And there are still a few reasons to hate multi directional specimens. Can this change? I think it can with some more research effort. And I hope it will because this will enable us to choose whether we want to use multi directional specimens or unidirectional ones rather than being constrained by the fact that uh, we are not able to deal with the problems that we have. So that's all I have. Sorry for being a little bit longer, longer than I should. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Torquato. So we have finished our 10 five minute presentation. Some were slightly longer, so we are a little bit behind schedule. Um, I would propose that we still have a brief discussion among the panel members. All of you can turn on your cameras again. Um, we have seen a couple of points coming back quite frequently, things related to crack migrations, non-zero-zero -zero interfaces, non-straight cracks, um, traction separation loss. Um, who wants to start off? Well, can I just kick off and thank yeah. all our speakers for some really interesting presentations. I'd like to pick up on this business about multi-directional versus UD. Uh, John, uh, John Botsis, you showed some really nice results with your method, which gave apparently very similar results for the different interfaces, but it looked like the damage was different. So uh, can you just comment on, would you expect the same value for the different layups? Uh, I would expect because, uh, first of all, uh, at least in three uh, three interfaces we tested. Okay, uh, what we noticed was like at the very at the very ends of the of the initial crack tip. Okay, there was some tendency to have some increased mode two, but very very little. 
very little. Okay, that was the simultaneous modeling uh, because we had you know, like a digital, not a digital twin, but almost like a digital twin. So, uh, but once this initiated, the whole thing went really mode one. And it was interface. It wasn't like you know intra or 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 crack migration. Now the crack migration started a bit later. I can I can I can put down I up the slide to show to you. Although this this work has been published uh, uh, in composite structures in 2020, uh, no 19. So, uh, but indeed, I we were we were very pleased. But again, as I said, we were really very very careful on designing the specimens. So the initial propagation, the, initi the initiation is very similar, but yes. as it propagates, you start to get more complex damage, and then it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, can yeah. I can I show you the slide? Yeah. I think it's. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Uh, let's uh, let's go back to share and then. Uh, uh, sorry, what happened here? Oops, got something. Something is is not going well here. In the meantime, if there are questions from the audience, you can already type them in the Q and A. We will start answering or addressing them after a short break. Sorry, I I don't know what is happening here with with my. If you cannot share, I could also share it for you, John. It is it is the slide where where this uh, the, this uh, uh, the multi, the uh, the angle ply results are you know where the the x the micro uh, no go back a little, you know forward forwards yeah here so uh, or or go 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 to the next one here so you see now the arc curves uh, and the low displacement curves being quite different after after you know after some initial crack length. Okay, Michael. So it's just the very beginning then. That's a, uh, so it's the very beginning yeah, because here yeah, we, we yeah. looked at initiation. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. and then, uh, and then of course, uh, but what it was interesting that uh, we had slow, bro slow propagation uh, that was also uh, 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 not flat crack, uh, as you can see, that is on the previous slide, I think. Here we are. Uh, you see the different sections on the right. Uh, uh, and also we had uh, jumps of cracks because the the bridging was in uh, like like in groups. Uh, bridging was built when the crack was growing uh, uh, like inter and intra. Okay, at the very beginning. And then when it was just uh, in the interface, it would jump, and then bridging would start again. So that was quite an interesting quite an interesting phenomenon. We measured even the crack speeds uh, that were not really very high, so we had no dynamic effects. But indeed, here it is the initiation that we really focused on, uh, at least at least on the data that I reported, because you know because I thought that was the theme of the of the, of the conference. Hmm. Yeah, no, very good. Thank you very much. Can I just follow up with a quick question to Torquato about whether you found the same thing with your different layups? Did you also find the same initiation toughness? Uh, actually, no. Uh, so in my case, the interfaces that uh, we had were zero theta, and theta was going from uh, 0, 15, 30, and 45. And in that case, we could see a slight increase of the initiation value with the uh, with the ply angle. Um, so yes, it, it was not a UV date. Uh, and, uh, this. Uh, it was what they call a quasi UV fabric. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's also good to highlight it's really important to characterize the damage because I think there's quite a lot of data in the literature where they didn't do that and they just think that it remained in the plane where they thought it was and it actually wasn't. And then the fact you can still report values, but then what the meaning of those values is becomes very debatable. No, but, uh, can I say something? I think all the details, I, I mean, again, as I said earlier, at the very, very uh, edges of the, of the crowd, of the initial crack at the very surface, there was a tendency for mode two, but very, very, I would say, insignificant. 
once the crack initiated, okay, uh, it, it went off and uh, mod one uh, throughout. But anyway, that's uh, uh, Yendel. I think I have a problem. Uh, I will reconnect. Uh, I will turn off and reconnect. Okay. Yeah, sure. There is a problem here. So during the break, I will reconnect. Yeah. Okay. So exp okay. Sorry for that. Any other people who want to raise a point? Yes, Ben. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh... I'm also interested in this multi-directional that's very interesting, but I also think it's very challenging because even if for in patient, I mean, you have residual stresses. Do you, uh, when you analyze them, uh, do you uh, analyze, how do you take that into account? I actually think Dr. Quato is very suitable to, to answer this. I think he addressed this partially in his uh, design. Yes. Yes. So, um, well, there are different aspects. So, um, there is some analytical work, actually quite a lot, a lot of analytical work from John Nair uh, that analyzed um, from an analytical point of view the effect of residual stresses. And as I said, uh, the main conclusion that we got to is that in order to avoid effects of uh, residual stresses on interlaminal fracture toughness, you should be using a double symmetric layout. This means that your specimen should be symmetric, the entire specimen, and each arm should be symmetric. Now, of course, this means that you can only have an interface of the type theta beta, where theta can be any angle that you like, uh, but you're forced to prove those interfaces. And actually, this only solves the problem of stresses coming from residual thermal curvatures. It doesn't solve, um, it doesn't give an understanding on the effect of other residual stresses because even if you use a layup like this, that is multidirectional, your clients will have residual stresses. And if you are able to change those residual stresses, then you will have an effect on the, on the uh, fracture toughness. So eventually, what you want to do is to avoid the effect given by thermal residual curvature, and you can do that with the specimens, for example, that um, we designed, the fully uncoupled multi-directional ones, but there will still be an effect from the residual stresses that you have in your place. So even if your laminate doesn't have curvature and the form only on, along the two principal directions, uh, multi-directional laminates will have residual stresses, and they will affect in principle, at least, uh, in the lung fraction toughness. Yeah, but sometimes if you have thick laminates, uh, really thick laminates, so wind turbine rotor baits are sometimes centimeter thick, uh, then you have exothermal heating, so then you may have temperature difference, and, and uh, therefore residual stresses that are even, you have different layers, and you could have different, uh, you know, cure temperature. So, so uh, even you make them symmetric, your, your residual stresses could still be higher in the middle than in the, because it has been to a higher uh, consolidation temperature. So would, would that kind of double symmetry still uh, handle that? So uh, that's a good question. I didn't uh, mention macro level stresses uh, because in general, when you deal with uh, uh, specimens for characterization, they are thin and you can have a uniform, um, let's say, temperature throughout cooling. So usually you don't have to worry for those kind of stresses uh, in specimens. Uh, but yes, I appreciate that in structure you may have those stresses. Uh, I would not be able to tell you uh, what the influence of those could be, not at the moment at least. I think it would also be very difficult to introduce a release film in the stick pull to the profile. So I wouldn't immediately know how you do that in practice. Um, maybe one more question between the panel members before we have a short break. Yes, Federico. Sorry, Torquato, to continue with you, but. Uh... To me, your presentation has been very nice because you have put some, uh, let's say, basic point. And sometimes this point have not been uh, completely 
uh, address it and answer it. For instance, the distance, sorry, the difference in between uh, meso uh, residual stresses and micro uh, residual stresses is very important, particularly when interfiber failure appears, when these stresses, these micro stresses may affect the solution. My question, I think you have related the selection of uh, unidirectional test uh, test on unidirectional laminate with the presence of residual stresses. My main concern, more than this, is the connection in between the mechanism of damage in your test with the mechanism of damage in the actual structure. I'm saying this because, for instance, having zero degree orientation of the of the of the laminas, you don't have mesomechanical. Um, residual stresses and in your actual uh, component imagine any any it doesn't matter can be zero 90 symmetric or multi multi isotropic or quasi isotropic you have so is possible to apply results obtained from a test not covering the mechanism of damage to the other this is more important than the role of residual stresses in my particular opinion so actually, that's a very interesting point. Um, yes, in the sense that in a given structure with a given stacking sequences, you will have a given set of residual stresses in each plant. Um, and that actually gives you the problem of trying to be able and have a specimen with the same set of residual stresses. So let's say I want to test an interface which is 0.45. How do I do that? And um, in many instances, um, what we have been doing till now is, okay, I want to test this interface. I know that there are problems with multi-directional layups. I want to have as many zero degree layers as possible and test my interface. But what that does is it changes the stresses, the residual stresses that you have in your flies. So you will have a specimen with the interface that you want, that you're interested in for your structure but with different residual stresses. So this raises the point, should we design the specimens like to avoid finite with effect? So should we introduce a lot of zero degree flies or should we try to have a stacking sequence that replicates the residual stresses that we have in the structure that we are interested in? And therefore you have a trade off there. And uh, I think this is something that still needs a lot of uh, investigation to to see what we can do and what we cannot do, I think. I think it's a very good point indeed. Um, I would propose that we take a short break and that we resume in 10 minutes. So at 4.55 here, at, at get started again. Yes, thank you, Michael, for starting the recording again. Um, let us first go through some of the questions from the audience. So. The first one is from Morten Christiansen about the bridging effect. So this is a um, question towards John Botts is about the effect of the bending in the bridging fibers. Can you try to respond to this, John? Yes. Uh, so here, I think the question is, uh, uh, what is the role of the bridging fibers? Uh, let, let me just, uh, let me just uh, answer this question in the following way. Let's take, a, a, let's take an adhesive joint and with two similar materials, say metal, metal, or composite, composite, and uh, test it. Uh, you are not going to see any scale effects. There will be no difference in the thickness. I mean, uh, sorry, rather, the thickness will not really uh, uh, affect the results. Why? Because the ligaments are soft, okay, it's a glue, so, okay, and the ligaments are going to take only tension. They are not going to take any bending. As such, there is not going to be a scale effect. Now, we have tested it, and we have done this with pure moment testing and end opening forces. Now, if you have bridging, however, the bridging fibers, carbon fibers, like, you know, they are bundles with, you know, 200, 300 fibers, take bending. So when these this fiber bundles are connected to the specimens, you know, arms, okay, they have the bending, okay, the bending stiffness, and this bending stiffness interacting with the bending stiffness of your arms will dictate 
whether they are going to be lasting during propagation or break. So the stiffer the arm, the longer the bridging fiber, or the bridging band. So the higher the R curve. Do I answer your question? Well, I guess he cannot respond directly. Um, but I think the question was also a bit about whether it's the bridging fibers are in tension or whether they are in bending or both. They are both. They are both bending and tension. But I think what dominates it is the bending because it interacts with the bending of the arm. And that's why now the bending stiffness of a pure moment and an open end opening force are different. And there, thus we see the difference of this testing configuration for composites. Yeah, okay. Um, so the next- I hope I answered, but I will be happy to, to elaborate more if I have a clear sort of, you know, uh, question. Yeah, so I think that has resolved the question, unless somebody wants to pick in on that. Um, we can move to the next one, which is one for Bodo about uh, fiber bridging and its effect on the capacity measurements or capacitance measurement, I mean. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe first let me point out that, uh, for example, when starting, I mean, the first crack propagation can be very nicely measured by the change in the capacitance. So we don't have to rely on visual inspection. <clears throat> so we have not in detail investigated the effect of fiber bridging on the shape of the of the curve yet. <clears throat> so the approach was uh, a bit different to have a tool to measure for the same material under different environmental conditions and to show uh, demonstrate that it's applicable for different materials. But so, for example, if we use the same material, which like to bridge and we take the we promote fiber bridging just by zero degree plies, or if we take the same material with plus minus two degree, then we have much less um, fiber bridging. So this could be an option to figure out what is the effect. But <clears throat> let me mention that it's really a simple, very simple uh, capacitor. So the electric field in reality is of course very different to that what I have shown, but we don't, we are not focusing on the real dielectric uh, permittivity or pro capacitor behavior. It's just relative from the starting, the drop from the horizontal to, I would say, to the decrease. It's a relative value. Okay, Michael, do you want to pick in on that? Yeah, I just want to ask, I noticed that the capacitance changes with the opening uh, displacement. Uh, I'm just wondering what the reason is for that and whether that affects the the results in any way. Uh, how how much it opens, you mean? Well, the, in your original graph, it, the capacitance had a decreasing slope with increasing loading. So I'm just wondering what caused that effect and does it affect your, your measurements? Yeah, I mean, which one do you know? Uh, I mean, uh, let's... I'm not sure. So on one so of the just, slides, you the showing... Greg, where's my slides here? Uh, just a second. <laughs> yeah, I think on slide five, I can maybe also share it quickly. Yeah, OK, then it's maybe you have. Um, Let's have a look I, at. I think yeah. Michael refers to yeah. the fact that this initial region where there is no crack road yet, I presume, that yeah. that's already decreasing. Yeah, that's. Um, I think this is um, more or less elastically loading. So there's a, so uh, I cannot change it. So it depends on, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, but it's crack opening already. So it's in the, in the curve at the very beginning. So the crack has started, but it's, yeah. So, Bodo, is this is this actually crack opening or is this displacement imposed on the arms? It's a displacement. So, yeah. Yeah. So you'd imagine the actual initiation only really starts yeah. here. That's the, where... Yeah. Exactly. That's the that's the I would say the displacement. 
And uh, this is just as an example for the definition. So it's gen maybe 2% decrease of capacitance or the other. And then you can plot this uh, back in the, in the next slide in the force um, displacement curve. Huh? That's where the same, the capacitance, the corresponding capacitance change. So that's how you calculate it. You wanna to respond to that, Michael? Oh, okay. Um, Bodo, I actually also wanted to ask a clarification. I noticed in these images here that you put this copper tape only on part of the width. So yeah. is there a deliberate reason not to go all the way till the edge? Knowing that the crack font typically is not perfectly straight, you are measuring more sort of in the center of the, the crack. Is that on purpose? Yeah, that was the purpose. So if you go to the what, to the uh, last but one slide to the there is a yeah here you see so we wanted to measure the crack in the center of the specimen and of course you can measure then if you make it wider for the whole specimen you could measure it then you get the average of the whole, whole thing of course yeah. and. Uh, to be honest, this was just the tape what we had, you know, and what was working well. So, <laughs> but it's, we know that it is like that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think at the moment there's no further questions from the audience. I see Federico wants to raise a point. Go ahead. Yes, it's again a question on something we have discussed. It's for John, John Botsis, this question. Uh, it is clear the effect you have explained it, and now in a further way about the scale effect and the fiber bridging. But my question is, you have noticed this in a test. However, if you go to a real structure, a real component, a real laminate, let's say the simplest, 0, 90 symmetry. I have never observed fiber bridging. So the question is, would we have a scale effect different from the that associated to the thickness of the 90 degrees uh, involved in the fracture toughness of one actual composite, one actual laminate? What is your opinion? Well, uh, thanks for asking. Uh, first of all, I will go and see in the structure itself that you notice this, are the same, is the same loading. That's number one, okay? Is the same loading that they impose in, in the lab. So I think if we if, if I have the same loading, then we are we are in trouble, but I doubt it will be the same loading, okay? So, and I think this is very important when we are trying to translate or transfer data from the lab to the to the real structure. I mean, it's, it's very, very important to have the same loading environment or not, not environment in the sense of, you know, the loading, Otherwise, we are going to be in trouble. So it's, it's something similar to the similitude used in the sort of fracture mechanics. Hopefully, when we have something in the lab, okay, and in the real structure, the, the volume, material volume, sub, is, is subjected to the same loading conditions, we will expect something, we will expect a response similar. Okay, so I, I, I will respond in this way. Yes, it's a very valid point. And I think this is, we have to really address it clearly. But again, I, I believe that, I mean, nature will not behave in the laboratory differently and in the real structure differently, as long as, you know, the environment is the same. Okay, I think Federico is happy with that answer. I think, Ben, do you want to respond to that point, I guess? Yes, uh, it, it's about, you know, I, I work with wind turbine rotor blades and they are ma mostly made of unidirectional. And, and uh, so, so there we, 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 we are we utilize, we see this effect. So it, it's, it, it is, of course, how, how things are laid up. Uh, that's a, a wind turbine rotor blade, the load carrying structure is product, it's, it's almost unidirectional because it's a very long slender beam, right? You put all the fibers in the longitudinal direction. So there, there you see the phenomena. I, I agree with when you have a cross ply or whatever, then you probably will not see very much. Yes, Michael. So I think we've had a couple of presentations touching on this question about cohesive laws versus fracture mechanics. I think that's a really interesting question about 
Should we be using fraction mechanics if it doesn't capture the whole thing and the cohesive laws perhaps are better? I don't know. But on that theme, can I just ask a question to John uh, Montesano? Uh, John, you did actually compare your uh, cohesive laws to the fracture values. And I'd just like to ask how you did that comparison because is that just the first part? I don't know whether we got the presentation there because what it looked like is that the area under the the cohesive, your cohesive law was the fiber bridging did not yeah the fiber bridging does not seem to be a very big part of that. If you look on the right graph there, then um, okay so, yeah so, so so that looks like that's you haven't got much of an R curve there. So I suppose the question is at what point was that measured? And uh, how does that relate to the graph on the left? Because they look to me to be a bit different. Correct. Yeah. So, so I, 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 I didn't really spend too much time on this last slide because I saw Yentl pop ups. So I know it was a bit rigid. over time. But uh, yeah. So, so the 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 middle graph is the actual traction separation law that was extracted. So, using the analysis uh, technique on the previous slide and the direct measurements of separation on the specimen surface. So, what you're seeing in red that's the traction separation law. Uh, not the well, not the R curve, of course, right? And what uh, what we see on the bottom of that is G one C onset. So that would have come from the R curve, but effectively corresponds to to the onset of uh, so the peak traction in the traction separation law. So so don't you want the traction separation law, which includes the effect of the bridging? Correct, and and this traction separation law does. But what I what I what I didn't have time to explain was if we compare. With our typical DCB specimen, which we see with the blue plots on the on the left, we see the R curves. They're they're sort of partial R curves. Um, the onset uh, G1C is comparable to what we measured in the uh, rigid double cantilever beam specimen. So that that's consistent. Uh, although I'm not I'm not comparing R curve to R curve. So I am showing the traction separation on the center. So we see consistency with with the, with respect to the onset. However. With the DCB specimen, the uh, again, the, the full data is not shown on the left plot. We have a sort of steady state around 0.8 to 1.1 joules per millimeter squared. Um, and there is, of course, a bit of scatter. And that comes from the DCB specimen where we did observe fiber bridging. So we did have fiber bridging, as you can see. Uh, for the uh, rigid double cantilever beam specimen, um, we did not capture, we did not visualize fiber bridging extensively, and that's mainly because of the, the ligament that you see sort of in the image above the, uh, the strain contour. The ligament is, is, is only about seven millimeters long. Uh, and, and if we go back one slide, or two slides rather, Yentl, um, the dimensions shown here, yeah, you can see the, the, the dimension here of seven millimeters. So it, it, it's quite short in this particular specimen. So we weren't able to capture uh, fiber bridging. Uh, and, and that's sort of part of the, uh, the next step is to actually look at increasing the size. But as I mentioned above on this slide, we were trying to, to, to decrease or to, to maintain a small specimen size and mass because the goal down the road is to actually do testing at high rates of deformation. So, so yes, yeah, so, so to answer your question, uh, we did not uh, observe fiber bridging, and as a result, we didn't compare the steady, uh, steady state uh, G1C values between the two samples. So at this stage, we we can we can have confidence that at least the the onset is is consistent between the two sets of specimens. Again, John, isn't this tail here? I would initially think that that is part of the fiber bridging, but it's not really the case, if I understand you correctly now. No, I mean, it, 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 of course, this is this this looks like a trilinear uh, attraction separation law. So, yeah. so we would generally associate that with fiber bridging. However, as I said, because the ligament is very small, we couldn't capture the full uh, displacement uh, very clearly. So, so, so fiber, fiber bridging didn't have a chance to develop as we saw in the DCB specimen. And that's but, why we didn't report the actual values. Uh, this, this tail, you're saying it is fiber bridging or is it something else? We we're, we're not certain because we weren't able to observe large scale fiber bridging in this in the specimen because of uh, the, the the short ligament length. So we can't we can't confirm that there there could have been sort of the 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 start of fiber bridging. But again, the, if you look at the displacement, uh, the full displacement, we actually displaced the samples beyond uh, 0 0.025 millimeters. The, the separation that's the separation I should say that's quite small. 
Uh, but but again, we weren't able to quantify uh, the energy release yeah. rate. So Bent, you want to follow up on that? Yeah, it's actually when I look at the numbers, you get you you get a peak traction value about sixty megapascal, and as the the drop off is less than ten micron. That's that's the same order of magnitude that these guys I was citing that did the, the experiment in the sim. Very comparable. Uh, and it was also, uh, I think this was uh, classified by epoxy. So I think yes. it's, it's quite impressive uh, that we're, we hit about the same uh, same values for these traction separation law of the crack tip, which I find is a, one of the future challenges to, to address. Just a comment. John Botsis? Yes, uh, I think in this, te in this testing, uh, test configuration, you don't have enough ligament to develop steady states, right? So, and I, I think that's, that's the, I, it's not a drawback, but this testing configuration cannot take you to the steady state. Is it correct? Yes, John, you're correct. I, and, and that's, again, this is sort of uh, first iteration, uh, one of the first main iterations for this particular test specimen. Um, we have to investigate larger, uh, a larger ligament lengths, and whether that means increasing the full specimen length or maybe decreasing the pre-crack length to yeah. accommodate that. Yeah. Uh, okay. th this was one of the, this is one of the, if you go back to slide four, Yentl. Yes. The, the dimensions shown here were sort of one of the first configurations which led to steady state crack growth. And that was really sort of the, uh, one of the main motivations early on. But but yes, I, I, I agree. And, I, and I, I mentioned before when Michael was asking, uh, the ligament length likely needs to increase and we have to still uh, go to the second iteration of the specimen uh, to to examine that. And one one short question: What would be the effect of the thickness uh, of of the of your polymer of the GFRP? What would be the effect of the thickness on your tra on traction separation? Would that be the same, or would that be? So we uh, th thus far we've we've configured we've uh, we've used a different configuration where we've had twice as many plies, so eight eight plies instead of the four that you see in the diagram. And the in terms of onset, we we didn't really see any effects. Uh, but of course, we didn't try you know sixteen flies, for example. If we go very thick, you know, presumably because we do have these rigid, what we assume to be rigid steel uh, adherents that are constraining the laminate, there could be some effects as you go quite thick. But okay, up, up until eight flies, we did not see uh, a, a significant okay. change in the G and the onset of G one C. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um... Let's go to one of the audience questions, which is still related to fiber bridging, which is obviously an important feature in DCB testing. The question here is whether fiber bridging is a result of fiber misalignment and stochastic porosity of a composite. Anybody care to comment on this? What is the origin of the fiber bridging effect? I could answer if there is nobody else offering. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if uh, uh, so, uh, if I can go to the slide. Uh, uh, I think it is slide number eight on my talk. I'll try. I'll try to share the screen, but I don't. I don't know if I. I if I manage it. Huh? So, Give so. It okay, I think I will share. Okay, it's there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, let me go back to this slide. Sorry. Oh, come on. Sorry, sorry. Ah, wasting time now. You want slide eight, I presume? Yes, this is it, yeah. Look, this, these are two different composite materials. Right? One, one with uh, on, the le on the right with a very brittle matrix, so a rather strong interface. So you see here a very nice crack between the plies. No bridging at all. Right? No bridging at all. So uh, this is the only, in my experience over the years, this is the only true interlaminar crack. Okay. Now, if I go to another specimen, which is uh, on the right, this is a, a tougher matrix so, and rather weak interface. Look at what happens. So the fibers are aligned, no? but they are like, you know, 
grouped in different in different in different domains. But what is important is the relatively weaker fiber matrix interface. So fibers, fiber bridging is built here because the crack, cracks or damage initiates at fiber rich zones. And then as they grow, they form, uh, they form uh, uh, bundles. So the fiber bridging is not really a, an, an effect of misalignment. No, it is really the microstructure of your material. And uh, of course, uh, there are other sources, but void the voids you mentioned. But yes, that's another another uh, another uh, sort of parameter in your list. Huh? But uh, uh, there is no misalignment. So what the ASTMF standards say, it's not true. It's like it's 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 not true that the fiber bridging is an artifact and has to be eliminated by just misaligning a little bit the fibers. No, that's 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 that. That's not nice to say this because it's not true. So if I go, uh, I have here on the on the side, I have here something also quite interesting. Uh, uh, to prove this uh, this argument, we ran some very nice uh, simulations, at least in my view. Uh, you see them in the middle with the red. So what you see here is the same fiber volume fraction. You have here thicker uh, thicker thicker tapes. Okay. We even go to thin ply composites. And here we went to the real material, which was as received. So what you see here, it's really a domains of rich fiber rich zones. So then here you see the simulations. So I will not spend the time, but all I'm telling you is that uh, uh, the in this microstructure where you have these domains uh, uh, of fiber, uh, of fiber uh, rich fiber domains, and metric zones surrounding them, the, the bridging was the highest. OK? The bridging was the highest because the, because the, the, the metrics, OK, the metrics will arrest the crack because it's tougher, OK, and will promote interfiber uh, uh, cracking and then, uh, uh, and then battles. And this is the simulation of the blue, blue. I'm not going to go into the details, but if you're interested, the paper is, is, is cited underneath. But no, no misalignment, nothing of that sort. It is really, it is really the uh, 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 the properties of the metrics and the interface. Period. Okay, I think Ben wants to elaborate on that, perhaps. Yeah, in some ways, I'm supporting what, what uh, John Butchers says. Uh, we had a study some years ago where we used the same fiber, same resin, but different sizing, and a sizing that was not made for that particular resin we were using. And then we got, you know, a much weaker interface, and that resulted in, even though we were processing in the same way with filament winding and vacuum infusion in the same way, uh, we got much different uh, fiber bridging coming out. As such, it, it was funny the fracture resistance turned out to follow somewhat each other because the, the weaker fibers, there were more of them, but each of the, you can say, the lig ligaments of the, of the bridging fibers uh, are, are, were detaching easily, so they were transferring less traction. So maybe in, in the, the net result would, was that the, probably they, they were giving about the same until we, we didn't have very long specimen at that time. Uh, but the one with the weak interface didn't reach steady state. So we, we believe they could have gone maybe been tougher. So uh, the interface is very important. The fiber matrix interface is very important. The fiber sizing, the fiber coating is very important in how much fiber bitsing we get. Thank you. Maybe a follow-up question from my side towards John and Ben and perhaps the others. Is it actually a good term to call this fiber bridging? Is it that in most cases more fiber bundle bridging? Is it not, not really individual fiber, but typically a collection of fibers? Uh, if you're asking me, I think it's, uh, yes, you could. Huh? It, uh, there are no single fibers; they are bundles. Uh, but I don't know if it is uh, uh, if it is wise to add another another term into this fiber bundle bridging uh, instead of fiber bridging. I think, well, but anyway, that's that's open in my opinion. But yes, it's it's bundles. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, Mike. I say we we have done uh, experiments in in the scanning ultra microscope, and we can see that. It, seems to be a combination of, of bundles and also individual fibers. 
So, so I think the terminology is, is, is okay, but you can maybe stress sometimes that it's ligaments or, or fibers or whether it's, it's individual fibers. I think it's, a, it's, it's important to, um, in some ways, be um, careful about how you, you characterize it. You could also talk about uh, how, how, how thick are the ligaments, how many fibers are within each ligament that bridges it. Yes, okay, Michael? So I've got a question for Antonio. Um, if you're there, Antonio, I don't see your camera, but uh, um, you showed the results for um, the G1C, which were quite low values, and especially for the delamination G1C. And uh, I was interested in you referring that to a G1C because you showed the plot and the mode ratio is changing as the delamination propagates from the transverse crack. So I'm just wondering how you'd actually define the, the GC for that case, given that the mode ratio is changing with propagation. So, so can you comment on how you measure that and on the low values you get? Uh, Michael, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to answer your question because Antonio, I, I, I do not see him in the, <laughs> maybe he, he has had a problem with the connection. Uh, yes, we were astonished about the low values obtained. And this is this reflects our concern that one thing is what we measure in test, and another thing is what we see from the real behavior of a component. So in this case, there is nothing special, no models, just, just uh, fracture mechanics and balance of energy and elasticity theory, nothing special. And in this case, we have found a extremely low value of, of GEC. This is one, the first part of your question, I think. And the, the, the explanation we have is that the mechanism of damage that appear in an actual structure when a transverse crack is reaching the interface with the zero in the 90 degree uh, layer is reaching the interface with the zero degree layer produce extremely complicated uh, damage that interact each other and produce low values of, of, of this property, which well, questioning the application of the value of tenet from an easier test. You wanted to say something? Well, yeah, so I'm just wondering uh, over what distance do you measure that? Uh, do, you, do you calculate that given that the mode ratio is changing? And do you take account of the, the residual stresses? Yes, this Antonio mentioned it. In this first calculation, uh, what he has presented here does not involve uh, residual stresses because on the one hand, uh, we, we, we have done both, but on the one hand, the value obtained to compare is obtained from a test that does not have residual stresses. So in any case, the important thing is that in, in the uh, using a mesomechanical model involving delamination uh, clock in a plane, we have noticed that with the delaminations observed, we have a dominant, absolutely dominant role of mode one. At the very beginning, we are talking about uh, delamination involving 10 fibers, 15 fibers, which is nothing. Now, when you obtain bigger delamination values, and you notice it because in the microstructure, you see, for instance, if you are in mode one, the deformation, I mean, the separation in between fiber and matrix is like this. If you have mode two, it's, it is like this. And you have mixed mode, is like this. So, you know, by simple observation, you confirm that when the delamination crack is very big, you have mixed mode. But when it is extremely small, and you control this with the thickness of the 90 degree ply, is dominant mode one. This is, this is clear. But we have no explanation, I mean, about the the difference, the small value of tenet. We are surprised about this. Well, I'm still wondering about the effect of residual stresses because the residual thermal energy is quite large in a cross ply. And could that not bias the value? It can be, but uh, we, we have uh, not finished the, the, the study. And uh, also I have to say that the value to put in a model 
uh, from our um, residual stress calculation is complicated because, I mean, complicated in the sense of the representativity of the value you put. It's not, in my opinion, as easy as to say from 150 degrees centigrade till room temperature produces these stresses. This is what you have in your in your uh, in your laminate. We have done several tests uh, with isolated laminate and uh, and laminates, and the relaxation is tremendous after one two one days one week or something like that. So I don't trust absolutely in results based in putting the 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 residual stresses in your model. Okay. Um I um I maybe want to shift gears a little bit and talk about where the crack actually propagates at the micro scale. Federico highlighted that a couple of times that that's important. He showed some really nice images of it propagating sort of on the zero side or on the 90 side. We've also seen images um, where it propagates in the resin rich area versus away from the resin rich area, more at the interface. I, I wonder whether in the experiments of Thanasis, whether you have high enough resolution to see where it propagated and how consistent it was sort of from one edge of your specimen towards the middle, towards the other edge. Do you have any information on that? Yes, Jentel. So the experiments that we conducted were at 25 microns uh, voxel size. So you can imagine that with these voxels, at this voxel size, we are not able to segment fibers, yet we th this resolution is sufficient to obtain the characteristic pattern showing the fiber orientations. So we were able to do, using the in-situ scans, we were able to see whether the crack remained at the intended interface, at the initial interface that was plus minus 45. And the results were very similar in terms of, at least qualitatively, they were very similar to the ones that uh, Professor Botsi showed. So in fact, the, the crack migrates to the subadjacent ply. So it starts from plus minus 45, and then it goes to the exact adjacent ply. If you follow, I, I, I have, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, if you follow uh, Professor Botsis' paper, you will see that, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me, Professor Botsis, the crack alternates, right? If it, uh, Once it propagates, it alternates again. It's not a stable, so it, it migrates once, then it migrates again, 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 changing interfaces. In in our study, the only main bottleneck of the in-situ tests were the fact that for the plus minus 45 interface, due to the way more pronounced toughness compared to the UD, we weren't able to see pro steady state propagation to a large extent. So we saw the first migration, but that was it. That was the difference with Professor Bott's experiment, I believe. Um, now for the UD, it remains, as we saw it at least, we didn't even see fiber bridging. We saw one interface, no migration, no ply bridging, and that was evident also by the archers, which are constant from initiation to steady state propagation, because no toughening mechanisms are engaged to cause that pronounced increase in toughness. Yeah, okay, thank you. I, Jesus, you wanna raise a new point or respond to this? No, it's just a new question. It's okay. for Lindsay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, Lindsay, I want to question you. How have you generated the pre-crack? Because I have tried several times in generating a pre-crack when printing, and typically the nozzle moves the, the the molding layer. So it's it was very difficult for me to assure the position of the, the molding layer. Thanks. Uh -huh. Well, indeed, it is a, a tricky thing to generate the, let's say, the insert or to put the insert. So what we did is we printed half of the thickness of the completely finalized specimen, let's say. And then we used an aluminium jig with a Teflon. We put it on over it. But indeed, if you start and if you put your Teflon till the very edge, yeah, your novel just slips over it. It doesn't grab it, let's say. So we added 10 millimeters extra where we didn't put uh, the PTFE film. We printed, then the nozzle is able to, to find its position. It continues and then it doesn't block. So you really have to have an extra, let's say, 
length of your sample in order and that you cut off later on. Eh? But else it is indeed uh, blocking everything. It's, uh, so you pause, you put your jig, and then you continue printing. And we try to, to make it as, as, let's say, smooth as possible in order to avoid that you have a huge, because it would influence your cool down, cooling down of your substrate and eh, the layers that have been deposited. If you wait too long, you you also influence too much the the properties of the the, the thermal uh, properties will will, will in, be influenced. Eh? So that's the way we did it. I hope this answers your question. Okay, Michael. So I've got a question for for Jesus. You showed the different values for the crack propagating in the different directions. And I'm just wondering about, um, I'm not sure, quite sure whether you showed it. I'm just wondering about what the, the relative R curves are in those two different cases. Uh, so so are you, are, is that a true initiation toughness that you're comparing? Or might it be influenced by some initial R curve, which, which might be different in the two cases? Maybe it's too complicated. A question, but I'm trying to understand the difference between those two results that you showed. We we forget the, the initiation phase. We only focus on the propagation. We let the graph propagate, and then in this zone, we measure the the fracture toughness. Okay, so we focused on, on this last part of the curve, avoiding initiation effects. So I'm just, I can't quite see, see the, the numbers there. So, uh, uh, so I'm just thinking that the, the, the propagation, okay, I guess the dimension is the same in both directions. So I just wanted to be assured that you were comparing like with like uh, and try to understand what the reasons might be for the difference in the, in the two measurements. Do you have any further comments on that? The, the difference, as I have mentioned, the, the way that the crack finds is completely different in both cases. In this case, the crack advances constrained by the fibers. So if, if the crack prefers another path, it's not possible for it. But in this case, the crack can choose the path that is more, more easy to, to propagate. So maybe the change can, the difference can be in this way of propagating. Yeah, yeah. I, I would like, I, I would like to, yeah, sorry. sorry. I would like to, uh, to add that independently of this explanation that Jesus has given, from the micromechanical point of view, is completely different. The advance in one direction and the advance in the other direction, because the uh, the involvement of mode one and two are different in both cases. So if we have something that has a completely, if not completely, a different <laughs> uh, mechanism of uh, advance of the damage, then the result has to be uh, different. And this case is significant, it's about 35%. I think this is the main reason, additionally, to that uh, Jesus has shown about the freedom in the case of transverse uh, crack to select the best, let's say, the best way of uh, propagating with uh, the minimum, uh, let's say, uh, opposition to the propagation of the crack. Okay. I think Bent wants to respond to that or raise a new point. Thank you, a new point. It's back to uh, Federico's uh, initial presentation of the climbing drum. You said uh, many nice things about it. Uh, and one of the things you said that I was surprised about is that you said it's a mode one test. But I mean, the specimen doesn't look symmetric. You're not uh, applying a load symmetrically. So, uh, I I find it hard to believe it's mode one. Uh, is yeah, it a mode it, one test? Why why do you call it a mode one test? Yes, uh, we have performed as typically a numerical modeling, 
And uh, the numerical model indicates that this mode one. Uh, what this more we have calculated with uh, the two procedures, uh, the value of uh, of G1C of I mean of G1C using DCB and G1 DCB has to be with a very thin lamina. If not, you cannot apply this with the 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 the, the tram. And the values were extremely similar, very similar. We know that this mode one in one case and in the other case has to be mode one too. Okay, go ahead, Ben. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of my colleagues also did simulation with finite element. I think she found it was a um, mixed mode with a phase angle of about 30% mode. You know, this defined by the square root of G2 over G1. So it's uh, it's it's not a lot mode two, but it's not pure mode one. Mm. Uh, but, I, remember. I have to say that we developed this for Airbus, considering they wanted to have a GC value. Okay, GC value for them is enough, but uh, they don't care about if it is mode one or mode two. But I have tried to answer your question. But originally the development was in independent, so for them. And this is the, in my opinion, show the importance of what we are discussing. So they accept a whole component based on GC, on the value of GC they obtain. For this reason, in my opinion, it's very important. It's not something that we discuss, we academic people, we discuss. So they use as the main reason to say this mm, will have we have manufactured it today is okay or not, because they apply for any component they fabricate. Okay, but we can continue discussing if it is mode one or mode two. <laughs> but the, the original reason was a different one. Well, thanks for your answer. Hey, Torquato? Yes, always relating to these CDP tests, I was wondering if when uh, Federico, you mention asymmetry, you refer only to the thickness of the two arms, let's say, or is it that this test has been used also with uh, non-unidirectional uh, specimens? No, basically it's just the thickness. Okay. Just the thickness, basically. But because uh, we have been asked in many uh, practical applications to perform the test. So with different thicknesses. And so it forced, you know, in the more beneficial sense to develop a theory to support the values obtained with uh, different thicknesses. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, John. You are still muted. You're still muted. Okay. I want to just say that what Fanasi said earlier on our uh, on the works because there are some similarities of uh, the micro cities. So I agree with what he said that uh, his results uh, match some of mine. Okay, uh, so, but I want to also come back to what Michael said earlier about fraction mechanics and cohesive laws. So I don't think we just, we didn't continue this discussion. Michael? Well, I was asking the question, I, I didn't have a particular Point of view. The question really. But was, I, I don't think we do. We we continue the. Did they someone answer or no? So, so that's uh, well, I, not directly, but, but perhaps we can open that up for people's opinions about that. Um, yeah. We, yeah. Should we be using fracture mechanics or should we be using cohesive laws? Okay. Well, well, let me ask you, John, since uh, uh, since you raised it, what do you think about that? I think we can use both. Huh? Okay. If we have long delaminations, I think fraction mechanics and cohesive laws are very well adapted. So that's uh, because uh, the bridging can be modeled using fraction mechanics, okay? And the local, uh, the growth, et cetera, and the rest uh, can be uh, modeled with cohesive elements, even if you don't have uh, infinite, uh, even if you have finite process on. That's, that's, you know, just uh, the bulk of, of, of my answer, but of course we can we can discuss this. Uh, but yes, indeed, I think uh, if you have long cracks, yes, it's just like like in uh, in uh, in uh, in fraction mechanics. Huh? 
you have very deep grooves, okay, just a very long uh, opening with, you know, finite radius at the end, okay, you can use fraction mechanics. And the fact is, the reason is because the crack is very long and you can use stress intensity factor. And just, you know, to tell you that indeed for long cracks, I think, or long denominations, fraction mechanics and cohesive elements approach can be work, can work very well. That's that's my okay. Thanks. Other opinions? <clears throat> Panayotis wants to come in on that one, or uh, or Bent? Uh, yes, uh, yes. I, I would like to to ask something about the the residual stresses because I'm not sure. Okay, wait, wait, Panayotis. Maybe if if I think Bent actually wants to follow up on this, let's first cap up okay. this question and then we'll go to you. Yes, Bent. Yeah, yeah, like uh, I think uh, it's, it's. I agree in some ways with John that I mean, so, so you need to look at uh, what problems. Uh, so some problems can be handled in both ways. Some some may be better with factor mechanics, some with crystal stone. But I mean, those two examples I showed over uh, like crack deflection and the formation of secondary crack simulation actually show they are more controlled by peak stress than by factor toughness. So uh, in, in in those. Uh, Problems. Then, then you need to know the peak stress of cohesive laws to to understand those problems. So, some classes of problems, uh, I think, uh, then cohesive zone modelings are better suited to model. Uh, this idea of saying that because a crack jumps to another interface because is because it's weaker is not necessarily the full answer. Yeah, I think it's a very nice point then. Okay, then I think we're going to switch topic. Panayotis wanted to ask a question about residual stresses. Yes, about the residual stresses. Uh, if our purpose is to, to eliminate these stresses uh, only in the interface, um, on the mid-plane of the laminate where we want to calculate the fracture toughness or in each interface of the laminate, because I th my opinion is that our purpose is to minimize them only in the interface. On the mid plane, I mean, uh, because if if we want to do this, then if I guess that if we use uh, a laminate, both sublaminates to be uh, symmetric and balanced, then we can do it. I guess it's more a question towards Torquato or mainly. Yes. So actually, I think um, as I was trying to comment to Federico before, I think it's not a matter of minimizing residual stresses because uh, in a real structure, when you have a multidirectional laminate, you will always have uh, residual stresses. So I think the objective should be to understand their effect and if possible to measure uh, interlaminar fracture toughness from a specimen that has a residual stress state similar to uh, the laminate that you want to use in an application. Uh, and that is unless um, we find out that residual stresses do not have an effect, uh, in which case we could use pretty much um, many different starting sequences with different residual stresses, and if they do not have an effect, uh, it's not a problem. Um, in terms of designing the specimen, uh, eliminating residual stresses only from the interface plies, um, that's quite challenging. Uh, and it still um, can have some problems in the sense that the fact that you have residual stresses elsewhere can lead to uh, additional dissipation mechanisms. So if you have far uh, plies that are far away from the delamination plane, but they have high stresses and they yield or they suffer matrix cracking, that would influence the fracture toughness that you're measuring. So I think it's more complex than just trying to avoid uh, residual stresses at the, at the end of this place, let's say. Or, may, or maybe for this reason, it's difficult. Mm. Yeah. Or, or maybe for this reason, you mean it's difficult for the analytical models that we have to, to, to incorporate this effect. Yeah, so the you think it's that, not just about in, including this effect in the analytical model? So that's a very good question. Um, uh, the thing is that I think when you go 
when you go to BIM model, to using BIM models to model, uh, um, to interpret, let's say, the, the fracture toughness, you lose some information, for example, about the fact that even if your specimen is totally uncoupled, um, you still have residual stresses in the in the in the blouse. Uh, therefore, I'm not sure if with uh, such models uh, you are able to predict the effect uh, of residual stresses. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. I think maybe a final question or comment from Federico then. Yeah, it's not a question. It's, a, it's just a reflection, uh, because we it seems that we are managing residual stresses as something negative that we have to avoid, and this is not true, particularly uh, when talking at micro mechanical level. So interfiber mm, failure dominated by the appearance of a bond between fiber and matrix is very much affected by the residual stresses at micro mechanical level producing a compression and delaying the appearance of damage at this level under tension. So I would say as a general view, I would I, my idea is that uh, let's consider the problem I have and I will decide if the residual stresses are positive or negative for the problem I'm finding in my material or in my structure. That's all. Okay. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. I think it's time to wrap up, maybe to have some concluding statements, and then maybe briefly also talk about the next um, the next workshops that we'll have in this series on fracture toughness. Anybody wants to make some general comments to conclude? Well, I could make a few comments. I think it's been a very interesting discussion and it's been quite wide ranging. I thought the discussion earlier on about the difference between the unidirectional and multidirectional was really interesting, uh, even though it's perhaps not conclusive. I think we've we've seen how a lot of factors affect the measurements, so we have to be very careful how we measure things and what we report. We've seen about uh, um, that the the thickness of the adherens makes a difference, and, and therefore the amount of bridging can make a difference. R curves. We've looked at the difference between the propagation direction, how that may affect it, residual stresses, uh, quite a number of different factors which may affect it. The mode ratio changing as the crack propagates. There are a lot of complications there which we have to be aware of and be very careful what we measure and how we, we state it. And then I think moving on to that last discussion about the cohesive versus the fracture mechanics, I think that's also really interesting. And perhaps that can give us a way forward to uh, to how we apply these things in, in structures, um, given the, the the amount of work these days is going on using cohesive elements at larger scale, maybe that gives us a route to uh, to take account of some of these factors within the structures. Just a thought. Thank you. John, you are still muted. Yes, uh, I, I would also like to add that uh, uh, efforts have to be concentrated on, on sort of uh, invariance. So what, what I'm trying to say with this is like, we, are try we will try to develop uh, theories and, and concepts that are easily transferable to, uh, to structures from, from the laboratory. Like uh, this, the effect of scale, the effect of interfaces, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that really can be I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's also some philosophical aspect into it. We really need to gear our efforts towards, you know, understanding that, that you know, it's, it doesn't really refer to the lab only, but how we can go beyond that. I think this is very important. Otherwise, we're, we're just concentrating the efforts and, and, and resources, uh, what happens in the lab. So I think that's, uh, we need to, to take this into consideration. So uh, all I'm trying to say is that we have to concentrate on engineering sciences, okay, that lead to general aspects of response that can be easily applied outside the lab. And I don't know if it makes sense what I'm saying. <laughs> and yeah, these were thank you, John. Very pronounced uh, thoughts. I think really good thoughts. 
Uh, but I, I, another comment, uh, not nearly as a uh, reflection as, as yours, is that uh, this focus on on uh, measuring initiation crack growth, J0, when we have ARCA, is of course most of the discussion here. But <clears throat> when I deal with big structures, you know, we see cracks that are growing centimeters, maybe meters stable. Right, so uh, it's also important to appreciate that uh, in real structures, it's not just initiation that matters; it's growth and how you know things can grow with la through layers. Benefit of fiber bridging because we have cracks that open quite a lot because they're long in big structures. So, so it's fracture mechanics uh, should not just be starting the crack growth, but be able to tell the full story. Well, yeah, yes, I, I don't, I don't object to that, but I think this is this, what I try, what I try to say. I, I, I try to say something which is inclusive, yeah, yeah, not necessarily, I not necessarily something that. I, uh, I, I like your, your comments; they were very good. Uh, okay, I but uh, I, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. Any yeah. else? Anybody else? Yes, Federico. Yeah. Minimum appointment. One crack does not grow if it is not initiated. So it is very important to control the growth, but it's even more important to control the appearance. And the appearance typically, I mean, we cannot say that the appearance is controlled by fracture mechanic theory. Fracture mechanic theory is developed to control the growth of a defect. And when we try to say, okay, this value, I can use it to predict the onset. No, no. <clears throat> That's yes, it reminds me a little bit of the problem of short cracks and long cracks. I mean, short cracks, we can't use fraction mechanics. In which yeah. case. So, but uh, anyway, that's... Uh... Um, okay. Um, so we... I have explained to you at the briefing that we have planned six workshops within this series on fracture toughness. We've already had two. The obvious next one will be mode two. And then we'll go to mixed mode together with mode three, interlaminar fatigue, um, which could cover both mode one, two, three, and mixed mode, and then translaminar. So if every, anybody has something that you feel is worthy of discussion in this workshop, you're always welcome to get in touch with me, Federico, or Michael to suggest us to include you in the presentation list. Um, if you have any comments on how we run these workshops on what we should do differently or better, you're always welcome to get in touch. Um, and I think with that, we can more or less conclude, unless somebody already wants to raise a potential presentation title for next time. All right, good. Then um, we can stop. We are five minutes ahead of time. I think that's fine. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thank you to all our speakers for thank presenting you. and debating. Um, and hopefully see you at the next workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Bye. 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 Thank you.